breathtaking, awe-inspiring, emotional, humbling. These are words that I've used to try to convey the experience that I've had to my family and friends of being in space, the sensation of being there, looking down at the earth below or at the universe and the heavens above beyond the stars. But words alone can't describe the special place that is space. When we think about the grandeur of space, the one thing that a lot of people don't necessarily put together is that space exploration is a human endeavor. Actually, it's a human endeavor not unlike many of the human endeavors that we have right here on planet Earth. In fact, if you wanted to send someone into space, you'd build a rocket ship. A rocket ship would be made out of metal, plastic, and ceramics, very similar to the materials that we touch and feel here on Earth. You take those materials and you'd fasten them together with nuts and bolts, rivets, and welds. So it shouldn't be surprising that many of the challenges that we have right here on planet Earth, we actually have as part of the space exploration industry. Things like coping with adversity, the technical challenges of unforeseen consequences, working together collectively, multidisciplinary, schedule pressure. My great-grandfather immigrated here to the United States from Mexico in the late 1800s. He settled in the area and worked for a, a mining and smelting company, a local company. So he was, he was a miner. Uh, it kind of really shouldn't surprise you that uh, his great-grandson would ultimately become a miner as well, right? This is actually me on my very first space mission, pickaxe 250 miles above the planet. I spent, I spent 12 years, I spent 12 years as a NASA astronaut, and during that time I had two missions to the International Space Station, and with those two missions, I did a total of five spacewalks, or NASA calls them EVAs, they like to kind of complicate things a little bit, but extravehicular activity. Now, while I was at NASA, I learned a lot of really interesting things about space and space exploration. But the most valuable thing that I learned about the space program and space exploration, I didn't learn in a textbook, and I didn't learn in a manual or a procedure. I didn't find them in drawings or schematics. And in fact, some of the most significant lessons learned in space that I experienced, the applicability is directly applicable here on Earth. And the reason is, as I said earlier, space exploration is a human endeavor, very similar to the kinds of endeavors that we have here on Earth. One of those that I want to talk about today is the idea of inclusion of diverse thought. But rather than define that to you, I thought I'd tell you a little story. In 2007, I launched into space on my very first space mission, STS-117, the Space Shuttle Atlantis. Our destination was the International Space Station. The prime objective was to take up a large truss segment that was going to be attached to the International Space Station that had a set of solar arrays critical for its assembly sequence. Additionally, we were going to be rotating out a crew member on orbit. Now, she had been there for a record six months at the time for, the, for a U.S. astronaut, and we were bringing up a fresh crew member to bring her back home. Now, Space Shuttle Atlantis and STS-117 was the fourth flight after the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster. And for those who may or may not remember it, Space Shuttle Columbia, when she lift off very similar to this photograph that you see here on her ascent into space, experienced a failure. A piece of insulation from the external fuel tank broke off of the fuel tank, ultimately striking her left wing and punched the hole in the thermal protection system. Once she got up on orbit, the hole went undetected. The thermal protection system for the space shuttle, it really isn't even used on orbit. No, the, the thermal protection system is actually used for re-entering 
the Earth's atmosphere and coming to land down on the ground. When you're going around the planet, you're going to around it at about 25 times the speed of sound, 17,500 miles an hour. So that's a lot of speed. And in order to be able to come to a stop on the runway, you have to get rid of all that energy. So the space shuttle did it as it would come in through the atmosphere. That atmosphere would basically serve to generate a tremendous amount of friction. So the space shuttle had essentially like a, a cocoon of hot gas that surrounded it during its entire re-entry phase. The temperature of that gas approached 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. For those who might follow space history, yesterday, 16 years ago, the Space Shuttle Columbia was re-entering over North Texas on her final flight home. And during that time, that cocoon of hot gas entered into the hole in her wing, ultimately causing the structural failure of the Space Shuttle Columbia. We lost the vehicle, but more importantly, we lost seven astronauts. And for me personally, I lost seven colleagues and I lost seven friends. Our flight into space was relatively uneventful, or so we thought. Once we got up on orbit, we opened up the payload bay doors according to our normal procedures. And it was when we opened up the payload bay doors that we were looking out the rear windows of the space shuttle to do a visual inspection of the payload bay, make sure things didn't move around so much. And it was then that we realized that we saw something that we didn't expect to see. There, on the rear of the vehicle, was a hole in the thermal protection system. Right at the interface between where the tile interfaces with a flexible shielding, we saw a, a triangular-shaped opening. Now, NASA had never seen something like this before, and it was located near the tail where the, the orbital maneuvering system engines, these are giant rocket engines that's used to move around in space. Right there, where the interface is made up, was something that NASA had never experienced. It was a hole in the thermal protection system. And as I said earlier, when the space shuttle comes home, the entire vehicle is covered with all sorts of thermal protection. And we just didn't think about this part. So we did the best that we could while we were up there. We took a bunch of photographs, collected a bunch of data, and sent it down to the ground and asked for some help. In the meantime, you know, we had a mission we had to go accomplish, and that was to dock to the International Space Station and continue with the mission. Now, we might remember a, a film that came out several years ago called Apollo 13. Well, Apollo 13 was an ill-fated flight of Jim Lovell's crew to the moon. They never made it there because they experienced a number of failures. There's a portion in the film where NASA engineers are faced with a perplexing problem to take a square CO2 filter and be able to make it fit inside a round hole for a different type of CO2 scrubber using nothing but the material that they had available to them on orbit. Well, this was happening, this photograph was actually taken while we were docked to the International Space Station. Because while we were trying to complete the mission objectives above, there was a ground crew that was working the problem, trying to figure out how we were gonna fix something that we thought would never ever happen to the space shuttle. Before them, they put out all the space tools that we could possibly come up with, all the EVA tools from the EVA toolkit. We had a, a team of engineers surrounding it, not just engineers, but scientists that, that studied thermal protection systems and, and astronauts who specialized in spacewalks and EVAs and trainers and flight controllers and flight directors, everyone who knew the problem, the severity of the problem, and had knowledge on what we needed to do to fix it. But as part of this group as well, were all the other people who had a vested interest in the mission's success of this STS-117 flight. And in fact, if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, there's actually, there's a guy there wearing a white shirt with a black tie. Well, that gentleman's actually a, a flight surgeon, and his role in the mission was primarily just to make sure that we ate everything we were supposed to eat and slept enough, and if we got sick or got hurt, 
that we could call the ground and someone could give us some consultation and help us, you know, figure out how to feel better. But he really didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about holes in the space shuttle. Now, they say that when you have a hammer in your hand, then all the world's problems to you look like a nail. And that's what you're going to use to try and solve your problem. Well, here before you, you see EVA tools, because this was an EVA problem, spacewalking type of problem. And, and I want to point out here just for a second, you, you'll notice how much of a human endeavor spaceflight is by look closely at the tools that you use to do a spacewalk are actually very similar to the tools that you probably find in your toolboxes at home. You'll see vice grips, pliers, scissors, spatulas. That's because spaceflight is really not that different. Environment's different, but it's still a human endeavor. Now, after Columbia, a number of the engineers and astronauts and, and everybody really at NASA worked hard to try and figure out what happened to Columbia and how can we prevent it from happening again? And also, what happens if something like this happens in the future? So I was actually privileged enough. I actually took, a, a, I took myself off a of flight status and went to go work with the engineers that focused on the repair materials and techniques. So that in the event that something like that ever happened again, we had materials and techniques that we could use to try and do something to come home. Well, because the, the damage that happened to Columbia actually happened to her leading edge of her wing, we thought that maybe something on the belly of the orbiter could go bad, or maybe the leading edge, and that's all we really concentrated on. One of the repair techniques was actually uh, something that comes straight out of the Ghostbusters. It's a, you know, it was a big backpack with red goo and had a big hose and a big nozzle and a gun squirted this goo. But the problem is that this equipment had never been tested in space before, so we didn't know if, even know if it was going to work. And the material that came out, we didn't even know if it could survive the reentry because it is actually designed for the belly of the orbiter, not where the damage had occurred on our mission. Also, we didn't even know if the material that we dispensed out would stick inside that little hole. We didn't even know if it would adhere. So that was a real complicated solution that had a lot of risk associated. Then you had the simple solutions. Hey, just use a really sharp pointing needle and metal thread. Maybe we can sew this flexible shielding back together again. Well, okay, in kindergarten, I had a, probably one of my very first science experiments. Now, when you go down and do a spacewalk, you're basically in a giant balloon. The spacesuit is a balloon. Inside the balloon is all the air that the astronaut needs to live. Outside the balloon is space. Now, in kindergarten, I learned if you take a balloon and a needle and you put the two together, the balloon usually ends up on the short end of the stick. And if you put an astronaut inside the balloon, he's not going to be too happy. So even then, a simple solution didn't seem so simple. But then, someone raised their hand in the back of that, that congregation of people and said, hey, can you use a stapler? And all the thermal engineers and the, and the, and the EVA people were like, <laughs> we don't have a stapler on board. And he said, yeah, you do. It's in the flight medical kit. Because the person raising his hand was a flight surgeon. And sure enough, the, the device you see right here is the same medical stapler that you'll find in a doctor's office that if you end up with a big little lacer, a big, little, a big laceration on your head that you can use to kind of close up that suture, your suture that closed. Exact same one. Well, the engineers took it. They tried it. It seemed to work pretty well. They tested it. It passed the test. So the engineers started writing it up and sent the procedures up to orbit. Now, I don't know if it's just dumb luck, good luck, serendipity, or you know, maybe it was just the universe shining down on me, but I was the one who was selected to do the repair. <laughs> but having had the opportunity to work for two years after Columbia, shoulder to shoulder with the engineers 
who had developed the repair materials to the belly were the same team who came up with a solution to fix the space shuttle on my mission. So it was an honor and a privilege to be part of that team. And so the procedures came up, we practiced them on orbit, and then on my second spacewalk ever, I went out and after three and a half hours, ended up performing the repair on the back of the space shuttle. And you can see myself here on the robotic arm with the space shuttle wing in the background and the big NASA meatball logo. Now, good news. Because I'm standing here today, everything worked out just fine. <laughs> we completed our mission objectives on the International Space Station. And 14 days after we launched from Kennedy Space Center, Atlantis touched down at Edwards Air Force Base in California, safe and sound. More importantly, bringing home seven astronauts safely back to their families, including myself. The lesson learned in space on the STS-117 mission is that of inclusion of diverse thought. Because at the table of problems that NASA was trying to solve, they welcomed, had a welcoming environment for all who had a vested interest in the mission success to be active participants. But it also took the bravery of someone who didn't necessarily have all the technical expertise in the subject at hand, brave enough to raise their hand and say, I have an idea. Because had it not been for that flight surgeon doing that, we would not have come home. And a $6.5 million spacecraft was repaired with a $2 stapler. Embedded in the DNA of NASA and space exploration is diversity. The International Space Station is made up of 16 countries across our globe. Different languages, different customs, different experience, different ways of doing business. Heck, even different measurement units. We use US customary, they use metric. But collectively, collaborating together, we have built what is the crowning jewel of engineering accomplishment for my generation. A permanent colony in space has been in existence since 1998 as a result of this. This lesson learned in space is one that challenges us to embrace the full spectrum of diversity, nationality, creed, gender, race, sexual orientation, expertise, experience. And by doing so, we can take this lesson learned in space and apply it to the challenges of our own human endeavors. And what we will find is that in the palm of our hands is a universe of opportunities. Thank you.